Our next speaker is, is Dr. David Johnson, a molecular biologist conducting research at the Institute for Energy and Environment at the New Mexico State University College of Engineering. You can, you can change the program, yeah. Um, he facilitates pilot project development and student research in fields ranging from biogas generation, regional mine closures, advanced oxidation processes for Superfund sites, water desalination processes of reverse osmosis and electrodialysis reversal, and biofuel and algae production. David is also director of the Institute for Sustainable Agriculture Research at NMSU, currently working with local growers, Los, Anim Los Alamos and Sandia National Laboratories, Texas A&M, Arizona State University, Natural Resources Conservation Service, and the Thornburg Foundation, exploring paths to improve food security in New Mexico, reduce atmospheric carbon dioxide concentrations, and increase farm and rangeland productivity through the development of beneficial soil microbial communities. Thank you so much, David. As you shift from bacterial dominance to fungal dominance in the soil, you see fertility and ecosystem productivity both increase along with the type of plant that grows optimally under those conditions. Note two things. Currently, our agricultural system is about 0.2 in the fungal to bacterial ratio. What we grow best are weeds. <laughs> we need to be up about one to one to be able to grow plants that we like to eat. The unlikely beginning to this research path was a project with USDA, and I received this the second day I got to work, and you can imagine my excitement on the project that my boss gave me. <laughs> he did me a big favor. <laughs> So USDA needed a system that had minimum infrastructure and labor investment, an efficient and low cost process, and a most importantly, a superior end product. Problem was, <laughs> <laughs> dairy manure is very saline, about 30 to 40 millisiemens. So my wife got tired of me coming in with manure all over my clothes from turning the piles, so she helped me develop a no-turn composting bioreactor. And that led to the rest of my research, because what that technology did, it gave us a composting process that reduced water by a factor of six times, reduced composting time by 66%. It resulted in a low, com low salinity compost, which in our area, it usually gets worse when they do the windrow composting. It's amenable to incorporation of vermicomposting after the thermophilic phase. But most importantly, it produced a high-quality, nutrient-rich, fungal-dominated compost. And this fungal-dominated compost is what allowed me to, look at, to continue my research in this area. So we did a test uh, with eight other composts in that area. And we did basically the standard soil test along with the biological assay to assess the fungal to bacterial ratio. As you can see, Nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium did not correlate well to plant growth. And to my surprise, neither did carbon. This kind of, I was expecting carbon to be the, at least one of the correlated factors. Fungal bacterial ratio, however, we had our, our squared of 0.87, and the, and the compost that we produced, which are these top two, produced twice the plant growth of any other compost. So a second experiment was developed where we could look at increasing soil carbon percent. And the soil mixtures were made from a, an arroyo sand and this compost that we produced in this reactor. Experiment two did, demonstrated that 70% of the total carbon assimilated by the plant was returned to the soil. Now from a survival standpoint, it seems odd that a plant would devote that much energy to the soil unless there was something important going on there. A third experiment looking at influence of fungal bacterial ratio on carbon partitioning. Here you can see the flow of uh, carbon into the plant biomass. It's pretty much linear. And here you can see the flow of new soil carbon that you, you have fixed during this process that goes into the soil. Here is respiration carbon. Putting it all together, you can see that you, you reach a maximum system carbon capture. And uh, but what's most interesting about this, when you look at the percent of new carbon going into the soil, in a very poor soil, it was 
even in your most fertile soil in this assay, still 48% of the carbon that plant made went back into the soil. So how will a, what I'm calling a biologically enhanced agricultural management approach work in the field for increasing carbon in? Beam implementation uses inoculation of soils with this fungal dominant compost. Only four to 500 pounds per acre. You can spread it, spray it, irrigate it, coat it, inject it, however you want to do it. You're just, basically, it's like a dough. You're adding a yeast, and that kicks the whole thing off. Plant cover crops designed for building soil nitrogen. Never bear fallow. Harvest as much energy you can on the soil area you have, as soil carbon is the key to microbial population increases, mutualisms, and the synergy development. Manage for the microbes. Low to no fertilizer applications, no herbicides, no pesticides. So in terrestrial ecosystems, you can see uh, swamp and marsh and the tropical rainforest produce about 200 to 2,200 grams of dry above ground biomass per square meter per year. You can see we do not do too well in cultivated land. Even though we can water it, we can weed it, and we can uh, we put fertilizer on it. So in my bean trials, uh, I've averaged 1,980 grams of dry above ground biomass per square meter a year. So I'm up there close with the uh, most productive ecosystems on Earth. In my advanced bean, I've produced 4,279 grams of biomass. So those will lead, in, the, in my transitional bean, it'll lead to 10.7 tons carbon per hectare per year, which is about 37 tons of CO2 per hectare per year. And then, of course, in the advanced, potentially we can see 19.2 metric tons of carbon per hectare per year. These are some samples of the cover crops we used in this research. Cespania, it's a legume. It associates also with ectorrhizal uh, fungi. And in the first season we grew it, it only grew about four feet. The second season, six feet. And by the third season, it was 12 feet tall. We were improving the soil every time that we planted, plus uh, all of the processes that we did as far as inoculation. This is a comparison of one year's application of beam with a side-by-side -side control with no previous cover crop yielded a five times increase in biomass over one year. This is a scientist from Los Alamos, James Barefield. We also planted some cotton in these fields to compare conventional approaches to beam. You can see on your left, James is right, the conventional is 150 pounds of nitrogen per acre. On the right is the beam transitioning after 1.5 years. We doubled the productive capacity of that soil just with biology. Commodity crop-wise, we looked at cotton and chili production. In cotton, we had a 59% increase. In chili production, we had a 98% increase, just using bean. A fourth growing period on this, this is a desert sandy soil trial. On this one, I've come in, I've inoculated, and I'm, I've grown a crop, I've cut it, hauled it off, and then planted another crop. And this is our fourth growing period on this. And we yielded 1,604 grams of dry biomass per square meter on this particular one. To give you an idea, that's about six and a half tons of dry biomass. In our area, that is a full summer's production on alfalfa. So this was in a winter cover crop. So I still had the rest of the growing season to accomplish more. So how does a biologically enhanced agricultural management or beam approach work for decreasing carbon out? And here's where we vary a little bit from what scientists are seeing, at least the ones that are developing the models for uh, the carbon flow out of the soils. They usually say that the more carbon you have in the soils, the more carbon you're going to respire. And as you can see, yes, there was an increase in respiration in this. But when you consider that I have a 20 times increase in beginning soil carbon mass and only a four times increase in soil carbon respiration. So we've been able to reduce the soil carbon respiration by four times. In the the low fertility, we had 44% of the beginning carbon respire, where in a more fertile or the uh, fungal, a higher fungal ratio, we had a four times, we only had 11% of that carbon respire. 
So it's, again, it's, it's biology that, that makes this happen. And it's, it's increasing the carbon use efficiency of the system underground. This is a one-year study with 32 samples comparing respiration in five different soils, from a desert soil to an advanced beam soil. You can see I have a seven times increase in the soil carbon, yet we only have a doubling of respiration. This is all of them put together. Uh, you can see there's a pretty good agreement on how this works, that as you improve soil fertility, as you improve the fungal to bacterial ratio and start to work on the, the biology in the soil, you get less respiration. So as we shift soil microbial dynamics from bacterial to fungal dominance, we observe increasing carbon in with decreasing carbon out. So comparing BEAM to other long-term approaches, West with 67 long-term studies uh, estimated we could capture 0.37 tons of carbon per hectare per year. Nigley, 0.2, Lal, 0.7. With BEAM, I've done 10.7 and up to 19.2. And the percent of arable land required to reduce all anthropogenic fossil fuel emissions, uh, you can see it's 852% with West, 2,430% with Nigley, 694% with Lal, 45% of the arable land with transitional beam and 25% with advanced beam. So at that capacity of increasing the soil carbon, 0.24% soil carbon increase per year, you have about a 75 year storage capacity for arable land. So we can do this. By stripping carbon out of the life and the life forces it supports from our agricultural soils, we have reduced the ability of these soils to function optimally. Restoration of soil microbiome population and its structure, along with soil carbon, promotes restoration of bio biological functionality of our soils. By promoting this restoration, we can be begin reducing atmospheric CO2 concentrations. We can begin now, at any level, in all agri-ecosystems. We can reverse soil loss by restoring and rebuilding our soils. We can slow desert desertification. We can re reduce soil salinization. We can reduce the downstream pollution from application of agrochemicals. We can restore beneficial insect and pollinator populations in this. And we can begin restoring our coral reefs and our oceans also. We have a viable technology to reduce greenhouse gases, but we cannot accomplish this without a policy that supports its implementation or without the presence of a stable and predictable market. Farmers and ranchers will need to be compensated for their efforts because the transition period is not easy and they can't afford to go out of business trying to do this. So that there's a subsidy at the beginning, but eventually these systems become self-promoting. So farmers and ranchers would need to know that they will receive no less than the stable minimum price for their efforts and businessmen will need to know that they will not be charged more than a maximum price for their investments so they can price it in to their products. But most of all, the consumer needs to know that the money will be spent on the best system of emission reductions to remove or re reduce atmospheric CO2. This market could be available in EPA's Rule 111D. It requires a mandatory 30% reduction in electric, electrical power plant emissions beginning in 2020. Individual states and power companies are responsible and liable for these. Currently, the wording in Rule 111D does not allow carbon offsets in agroecosystems. But the Clean Air Act pretty much specifies that the reduction or elimination of the amount of air pollutants through any measures to protect and enhance the quality of the nation's air resources, to encourage and assist the development and operation of regional air pollution prevention and control programs, promote the coordination and acceleration of research, encourage and cooperate with institutions and organizations and individuals engaging in development and operation of regional air pollution prevention and control programs. Their criticism is that it deflects effort from abatement. But as Brian Murray from the Nicholas Institute said, he said, in his view, this criticism is misdirected. Defle deflecting abatement from cap sectors is exactly how offsets work to reduce cost. It should be the overall reductions we are interested in, not where they occur. So the cost of CCS, which is EPA's recommended um, methodology for reducing CO2, 
They only usually give you the CapEx cost, or what it costs to build it. They don't give the financing, the parasitic loads, the overhead and maintenance, and the transportation storage. As you can see, that price ranges from 218 to $264 per ton of CO2. And they don't include any profit in there, too, and I'm sure there's going to be a profit motive somewhere. If you compare renewables, most renewables are relatively expensive, from 58 to $377. CCS Geological, as I said, 218 to 264. CCS Enhanced Oil Recovery, there's no net CO2 sequestered. All that CO2 that's put back into a formation pushes oil out on the other end, and you're burning that oil, you're just displacing where the CO2 comes. RECs are the closest in price, but they depend on renewables. So the only system that we have is our agroecosystem using something like BEAM, and that price is from 17 to $22 per ton of CO2. CCS liabilities and geosequestration, migration of injected CO2, unintended leaks, seismic activity, acidification of aquifers, long-term monitoring, no beneficial ecosystem services, whatever. BEAM, however, in, eco, gives ecosystem services that increase soil fertility, water storage in soils, plant water use efficiencies, soil nutrient availability, reduces plowing, reduces fertilizer application, and downstream pollution of streams, lakes, rivers, and coral reefs. It allows farmers to transition to a sustainable and ecosystem-friendly approach to agriculture, too. Cost of offsets using agri-ecosystems for carbon capture, a 6% energy surcharge, about one cent per kilowatt hour increase in electricity, 15 to 17 cents increase in cost of gas and diesel, or $2.53 for the average plane flight, less than the cost of a drink. We enjoy our lifestyles, but it takes energy to support them. Regrettably, we are not going to be able to conserve our way out of this. So if we're to begin reducing atmospheric CO2 concentrations, we have a choice. Do we adopt a system like CCS that is costly, 10 times greater than V, years away from implementation, creates another waste stream to deal with, and the infrastructure will last only about 25 years and will have to be rebuilt? Or do we adopt, adopt something like BEAM where it's economical, ready to implement, Workforce is already trained. Farmers are ready to do this. There's multiple co-benefits. We'll eventually become self-promoting, and then we'll continue to capture carbon without further subsidies. That's the most important part. The choice is ours. We must use it wisely. <laughs>